All right, good evening, everyone. This is chapter 13 of the Psychology Second Edition textbook. Uh, and tonight's focus is gonna be on industrial and organizational uh, psychology. Uh, very often you will hear it as described as I and O or I O psychology. So you may hear me say that tonight. Um, so I just kind of want to let you know that, that, that uh, there are different names for it. They, they do the initials. So, um, so I O psychology, let's look at what it is. So first it's a branch of psychology that studies how human behavior and psychology affect work and how people are affected by work. And IO psychologists work in academia, they work in government, they work in consulting firms, they work in business. I think I shared with you uh, at the beginning of the semester, um, a friend of mine, he actually has his PsyD, which is a doctorate in psychology, and he does advertising and works for business. And so that's another, another aspect of of psychology that uh, would fit under this. So when it comes to um, INO psychology, you know, breaking it down, right? Industrial psychology is that branch of psychology that studies the job characteristics. In other words, what does the job entail? Um, what are the tasks to be performed? Um, it uh, looks at applicant characteristics. So like who's applying to the job? What's the best match? Um, and industrial psychologists will also look at uh, uh, employee training and performance appraisal, uh, appraisal. And we will, we will talk about some of that this evening as well. And their main focus is hiring and maintaining employees, right? And then considers um, uh, legal issues regarding discrimination in hiring or in firing. And then organizational psychology studies the interactions between people working in the organizations. And they also wanna study and know what is the effect on those interactions on productivity. So they look at things like uh, worker satisfaction or job satisfaction, that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit later on. Um, motivation, commitment, uh, management styles, leadership styles. Um, what are the are, what are the role expectations? What are the social norms and those um, expectations? And then they also look at um, harassment, um, which can include sexual harassment, um, hostile work environment, those kinds of things. And then, um, unfortunately, we will also talk about workplace violence as we move through this section. And if you've ever heard the term ergonomics, that came from Europe. <laughs> so you may see that on the exam. Um, you know, it's one of those things that we've been saying it for so long, we may not realize where it came from, but ergonomics really kind of started, started there in Europe. And it studies how the workers interact with the tools of, of their job, right? So here you see a picture of um, a lady at a desk uh, and, and, and uh, the human factor psychology, this is what they look at. What is the best uh, interaction uh, between the tool and the human for, that's best for the human, best for productivity, et cetera. They look at you know, workstations, information displays, lighting, all kinds of stuff. We'll talk about lighting here in a few minutes with the Hawthorne experiment. So let's look at some history. Um, you will want to know these for the exam. You'll kind of want to know the differences between, um, uh, between these historical figures. Uh, James Cattell, uh, Hugo Munsterberg, uh, Walter Dill Scott. Um, and if you remember from the first chapter when we talked about uh, uh, Wilhelm Wundt, um, he was the German psychologist that created the first psychology lab in Germany um, in the late 1800s. Um, <coughs> all of these individuals were students of Wundt. Um, they conducted research um, at that time uh, that we now call industrial psychology. And so um, 
Cattell, he founded the Psychological Corporation, which was um, a consulting company. And then Musterberg published um, the book, you know, Psychology and Industrial Efficiency. And that was in 1913. And that focused and covered employee selection, training, um, and effective advertising. And then Walter Dill Scott was one of the first study, uh, psychologists to study psychology and advertising, uh, management and personnel selection. So, and he published the first books to describe the use of psychology in the business world. And as I cited the example of my friend earlier, um, you can get a psychology degree, a doctorate in psychology and be able to use that uh, in the business world. That's what he does. And then World War I, you'll remember Robert Yerkes from the um, uh, he organized um, and developed methods for screening and selecting enlisted men. And he developed what was known as the Army Alpha Test to measure um, an enlisted person's mental abilities. And then um, Walter Deal Scott and Walter Bingham organized a group with the goal of developing selection methods for officers for the armed forces. So they were kind of looking at, um, at those two, two items. And then Elton Mayo um, conducted studies at Western Electric's Hawthorne Works. Actually, that's a typo. Uh, it should say works, um, 1929 to 1932. Now I posted a video, um, uh, actually a couple of different videos uh, on the Hawthorne experiment, which I highly recommend that you, that you watch. Because of time this evening, um, I'm not gonna present them, but uh, for studying for the exam, um, I highly recommend that you watch them. But basically what they were trying to do was they were trying to figure out the best way to um, enhance productivity. And so when they went into the um, Hawthorne works, they did all kinds of things. They changed the lighting, they made it brighter. Um, then they made it, the, then they changed the lighting and made it dimmer. They spread out the workstations and they were trying to examine how um, these different things were impacting productivity. Well, what they found at the end, at, 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 they didn't really realize it at first what exactly was happening, but they found that, that no matter what it was that they were doing, that, their, uh, that productivity actually increased in, in the Hawthorne works. Um, and so later on, more researchers came along and conducted some research on that. And basically the main takeaway was that, that when people know they're being observed, that they actually perform better. And so, it, so it's interesting because management, the only thing they were doing was trying to change different things, thinking that they could improve productivity. And they did all kinds of different things. And there wasn't one thing that seemed to, uh, to work. But later studies came back and said, no, is the fact that, that they were being observed. Um, and so think about it. If, you're, you know, if you know you're being observed, does your behavior change? And that's kind of like, a, a, well, somebody wants to answer it, they can. But I kind of answer asking it in a rhetorical manner, just to kind of think about it. Um, they also found that it depended on the type of tasks that was at hand, but for the most part, people's um, productivity did increase um, when, they, when they believed that they were being watched. So, uh, let's see. So the Hawthorne effect, uh, I'm just gonna kind of hit down here at the bottom is basically this. This is the increase in performance of individuals who are noticed, watched, paid attention to by researchers or supervisors, which is kind of what I was saying on the previous slide. Human behavior changes when we're being observed. 
Uh, and that's the, that's the long and short of the Hawthorne effect. <laughs> and then somebody says, yes, it's the pressure. Um, and it could be. Um, actually, some of what they found too when interviewing some of the employees later on was that they actually thought that some of the supervisors actually cared about their well being. And so that might have been another type of motive that, um, uh, that may have played at hand here, right? So there's lots of different variables. But that's the main takeaway that I want you guys to have is that if you're being observed, your behavior is probably going to change. Your performance is going to change. Hawthorne effect is very famous. You'll hear it. If you've never heard of it before, now that you've heard about it, you'll probably hear it uh, later on in other uh, psychology classes, maybe even in the news at some point too. So some other historical figures, I'm gonna kind of run through these really quickly. Um, Kurt Lewin, he studied the effects of leadership styles, uh, team dynamics, team structure, um, how their interactions, their cooperation and um, communication and competition was impacted. And he was the one, if you've ever heard the term group dynamics, which is another term that you'll hear a lot if you go into the psychology or counseling field, um, group dynamics is, is, is a very common term. This is the man that coined the term. And then there was Frederick Taylor. And what he worked to do was he wanted to make workplaces uh, better in order to increase productivity. <coughs> Excuse me. And he examined management styles, um, how personnel were selected and how they were trained. And then Lillian uh, Gilbreth, if you've ever wondered where the drawers in your refrigerator doors come from or the pedal operated um, garbage can tops, you have her to thank for it. She's known as the mother of modern management. And she, she was driven to find ways to increase productivity. Um, she looked at uh, efficiency improvements that looked at the number of mo motions required to perform a task and see if there was any way to make that less. Um, because the less steps you have to do something, the quicker you're gonna be able to do it. The quicker you're able to do something, the higher your productivity is gonna be because the more pieces, for instance, if you're manufacturing, the more pieces you're gonna be able to put out per day. Um, and then she also looked at employee fatigue, uh, and time management stress. You know, earlier one of the fellow students kind of typed in the chat about um, when you're being observed um, that pressure is involved. So there could be, here we're talking fatigue and then what kind of pressure do we feel under time management stress, right? And then she also found that many employees were motivated by money and job satisfaction. So money is an important factor, um, but but so was job satisfaction. Person's gotta be happy with the work that they're doing. So now moving on to selecting, excuse me, selecting employees, there's a couple of things that we wanna look at. And I'm actually gonna show you this database here um, called ONET. I'm gonna uh, go to that website here in just a second and um, and, and show you what that's like. ONET is actually a, a very, it's a very cool uh, database. If you ever have time to uh, actually go through it, it, it's very interesting. There's lots of different things that you can find on there. Um, rates of pay, average pay, um, jobs that are up and coming, like the fastest growth that's gonna be coming. Um, high demand jobs, things like that. So ONET is a great database. Um, if, you're, if you're not sure what you wanna do when you grow up, um, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, I always used to say that, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, this, is, this is a way to explore different um, uh, job titles 
and see what their um, uh, uh, tasks entail and uh, the knowledge, skills, aptitudes, things that you need or the uh, KSAs, right, um, that you'll need. And um, Antonio also points out, he sent it in the chat, that ONET is also useful when creating your resume for a specific job. And that's a great idea um, to use ONET for, for, as a reference for that. Uh, so let's go ahead and go over to the ONET site here for just a second. Okay, so here we are at the ONET online um, site. And uh, I'm just gonna show you a couple of quick things to kind of just um, uh, show you what you can find. And I'm really gonna focus on find um, occupations here. So if you go down here toward the middle of the page um, and you see find occupations and there's a drop down menu and you can look at Bright Outlook or Career Cluster, or you could search by a specific um, industry. Um, but we're gonna go with, let's go with Bright Outlook. Let's see what jobs um, are going to be predicted to be increasing. So you select Bright Outlook, you look at there, and here you have um, another drop down menu. We're gonna look at rapid growth. So let's just see what we get here when we look at rapid growth. So when we hit that, you'll see there are a whole lot of jobs, right? Um, they're listed alphabetically. So if there's a particular job that you're interested in seeing, oh, I wonder if what I'm interested in is, is here. So I'm actually gonna go down um, because I'm running this. I'm gonna look at what I'm interested in for a moment. Although I happen to know that some other people in this class are interested in the same thing. So if we go down here to, okay, so here we go. There's a couple of them. One is mental health and substance abuse, social workers, right? And so um, you come here and it, and it gives you a report and it tells you what is the different things that you do, counsel clients and individual group sessions. So as Antonio pointed out a minute ago through chat, this is a great way to kind of build your resume, um, know what, what people do. And if you're already in the field and you're trying to create a resume and have trouble um, thinking of things, coming in here and, and looking at this can, can help. Uh, what's the technology and skills that it might use? Um, so like medical software, it, here's a great example, oops medical software, client records, e EMR software, um, or EHRs, you might hear EHRs, which is electronic health records. Um, also desktop publishing softwares. I will tell you, I use Adobe. I use Publisher. I use, of course, Outlook, Word, Excel. Um, and I also use um, an electronic health record as well. Um, every single day throughout the day. This also tells you some, some skills, or I mean, some knowledge, sorry. Um, so knowledge of psychology, knowledge of human behavior, um, therapy and counseling, knowledge of principles, methods, procedures. So you can see there's, um, and see here's your KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities, right? KSAs, um, skills would be active listening, social perceptiveness, in other words, being aware of other people's reactions and understanding why they react the way they do, um, speaking, reading comprehension, uh, other abilities, oral comprehension, oral expression, um, problem sensitivity. So this gives you all kinds of different uh, aspects to the job, which is very, very interesting. It also tells you um, education requirements. Now I picked on mental health and substance abuse. So you'll see, you know, master's degree um, is on there, bachelor's degree. Uh, I can tell you the program that I teach in here at City College, the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies program, that is a certificate level or an associate's degree for, um, that can actually begin 
uh, with counseling. Um, although their, their scope of practice is limited to strictly addiction uh, and not any other co-occurring disorder, which we'll talk about in the upcoming chapters. Um, but uh, associate's degree could also be listed here under this education. Uh, so there's all kinds of information here. So anyway, if you ever get a chance to check out ONET, um, I, I highly recommend it. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of information here. Um, so you could probably spend, spend hours if you have that kind of time. Okay, so we were just looking at the ONET database. And then, so getting back to job advertising, um, by the way, somebody who's advertising for a job may look at ONET to, to write up their, their uh, uh, job um, advertisement. Um, but in job advertisement, if you're looking at uh, job analysis, right, that's accurately describing what the task is, what the job is. And there's, there's two different types of, two different ways you can write on this, right? So there's task oriented, which is what lists in detail what tasks will be performed. You know, um, for instance, must be able to, um, you know, do group and individual counseling. Um, oh, sorry, that's worker oriented. I was giving the wrong example. Um, so tasks might be um, using, um, using Microsoft Word, using Wellagent EHR, using Sandwits, um, billing um, uh, drug Medi-Cal, um, that kind of stuff. So those might be the tasks that, that are described in the job um, uh, analysis for the ad advertising. And, um, and then worker oriented analysis or advertising, right, describes the characteristics of what the applicant needs to be able to provide, right? So those are those KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities, right? Um, that I just showed you on ONET um, as some examples of KSAs. And then there's also ca uh, candidate analysis and testing. Um, and so that can involve testing, can involve interviews, um, creating work examples or um, exercises. I give you an example, when we were um, at my um, outpatient uh, treatment center, when we were looking for a front desk receptionist, um, and because I also handle a lot of clerical activities, we actually had them uh, come in and create an Excel spreadsheet, a simple one, um, just to see what they're, you know, if they were able to um, use Excel, uh, create a memo in Microsoft Word, right? Um, things like that. Because uh, there's a certain level of, of um, KSAs that, that were needed for that job that we don't necessarily have time, we can't train you in that. Right, so there's a certain level that you have to kind of come in with. So, another thing that they might use is like personality tests, like the uh, MMPI. If you've ever heard, well, yes, you have heard of that. We talked about it in the last chapter, um, as an example. And there can also be integrity tests, physical exams, drug tests, physical fitness uh, tests, depending on what the what the job is. So, like if you're applying to be a firefighter, you'll go through example, some physical fitness tests as an example. And then interviews, what's interesting about um, interviews is they've actually done some research on this. And one of the things that they found with applicants, if an applicant comes in and they're really not maintaining eye contact um, and there's not a lot of smiling, um, that tended to lower their ratings which really kind of means they probably didn't get the job, right? Um, so this is where, you know, making that direct eye contact, having a strong handshake, um, well, pre-pandemic strong handshake, I should say, um, smiling, um, trying to be relaxed uh, is going to increase uh, um, ratings for an, an applicant. And then there was two different types of interviews that I kind of want to talk about here too. Um, and that's unstructured interview 
versus a structured interview. And the unstructured interview is basically different questions for different candidates. Um, and usually they're not prepared beforehand. Um, sometimes it can seem like ad hoc maybe. Um, but the research shows that structured interviews tend to give you um, a better idea of the candidate's job performance, future job performance. Um, and <laughs> so for example, where I work, when we, when we interview uh, new counselors or, um, or uh, case managers or peer advocates or recovery advocates, it's what we call them, um, peer, like peer coaches, recovery coaches, um, we ask for those jobs, we ask the same questions of each person. We ask them to, to cite an example of when they engaged in this behavior. Um, I will ask uh, about their experience writing burp notes. Um, and you won't have to know what a burp note is for the exam, but it's a, it's a format for writing progress notes. There's burp, there's dap, there's soap. Um, and I will ask uh, them to give me an example of, of a, of a progress note, uh, what they would put in each section. And what that does is that tells me what their knowledge, skills, and abilities are around writing notes, which is very, very important um, for the job. That's how, we get, that's how we get reimbursed. If a note is poorly written, the county or the state can come in and say, we're gonna disallow that, right? So these questions are prepared in advance. We ask about ethics, and I'm just using the example of my, uh, my treatment center. Um, and we have a standardized way of rating each of their responses. And so, and generally what we do is we do what are known as panel interviews. So I will interview, uh, the program manager will interview, the other mental health clinician will interview, um, and we'll all be in the same room and we're all rating the same questions. And then afterwards, after we've interviewed everyone, they, they get scored and we discuss them. Um, but this typically, uh, is better at predicting future performance of a candidate. So you can rule them in or rule them out based on a structured interview. A little bit later on, and I'm mentioning it now, but we're gonna talk about job stress. And I will tell you, in, in my experience, job stress starts with this slide, whether or not person's gonna be experiencing it or not. And you'll see that later when we talk about job stress. But when you hire an employee, um, you know, we put them through orientation and that's, that's what we do to educate the new employee about what is our values? What is the vision of the company? Um, you know, what is, what is our organizational culture, right? At mental health systems, we have this thing called the, you know, the pillars that, that we look at, you know, um, ethics and uh, cultural inclusion, things like that. And so new, new employees go through all of these uh, aspects of it during their orientation. And then the next aspect of it is mentoring, right? And this is where a, an experienced employee is matched up with a new employee, um, kind of like a shadow you know, for the you know, first week or two. Um, and some of the research is, is that, uh, that has been found is when a company has a mentoring program that it actually positively affected um, the protege's compensation, the number of promotions uh, compared with non-mentored employees. And those mentored employees were more satisfied with their careers and had greater job satisfaction. Now, this might be one of those situations where you might think to yourself, well, duh, um, that kind of makes sense uh, because that person has been well integrated into the company. They've been trained. They weren't thrown to the wolves, so to speak, right? So a company that doesn't have a good mentoring program, the company, the, their employees may not be as happy, right? So they don't get the effects, the positive effects of of the mentoring. Um, and 
hiring and training employees is a very expensive uh, proposition. It's another thing that INO psychology looks at, right? Is um, maintaining employees uh, in the workplace, not having high turnover, right? Which is much, much more expensive. The other thing that INO psychologists look at is, is evaluating employees. And um, in the diagram here uh, called the 360 degree um, feedback appraisal, you know, the employee being um, evaluated is in the center. And those evaluations come from supervisors, reports, uh, peers, customers, uh, and the employee themselves will actually uh, do an appraisal on themselves. Um, and while it's, it's actually a very great idea because it provides different perspectives on, on the employee's performance. Um, but what's interesting is, is that it often fails to accomplish the purpose um, because they just are not used correctly. Um, I can tell you in the past, uh, you know, because I've been working for a very, very long time. There's a lot of companies that actually use this, like, um, like I will be given a, an employee uh, appraisal, evaluation. Um, my, uh, in one company I worked for, my subordinates also gave me an evaluation. My boss gave me an evaluation. Um, and then any customer feedback um, that would happen, um, I was not working in the mental health or counseling field at the time, would... Um, give me, uh, you know, I would be rated on whatever customers said as well. Uh, I'll tell you, I was working in the casino industry. So, um, so when it, so I got lots of feedback from lots of different places. Uh, but what I found, especially in that particular environment, we were always so pressed for time that everything was rush, 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 rush. And in my opinion, this would be an example of, because it was a more rushed system, whereas the format might be very good, it just wasn't implemented well, right? So, um, but the purpose of a performance appraisal is to evaluate the employee's success or lack of success at performing their duties on the job, right? And it, and it should be an objective measure. Um, it's often used to motivate employees to perform, uh, to improve their performance and expand areas of competence. And we'll talk about, uh, well, it's coming up in a future slide. Oops. There we go. Um, all right. So the other thing that we look at in INO psychology is, um, again, biases. So remember in the last chapter in social psychology, we talked about uh, prejudice and discrimination. Um, some of that we're looking at here as well, right? And so there are certain laws that have been created that protect um, applicants and employees from hiring and firing decisions that are illegal. So for example, um, it's illegal for an employer to ask how old you are uh, because of age discrimination, for example. So one of the things that I always recommend whenever I, I worked, I used to work at an inpatient treatment center. And one of the things that I used to do is when they got to the end, they got to move to a different phase. And it was all about job search and reintegrating into the community. And we would do practice interviewing and, and practice filling out job applications. And I looked at everything for, um, with my clients um, from even the email address that they use. And some clients would put their, the year they were born, like they would go, um, uh, you know, T Smith 1970 at gmail.com. Well, an employer doesn't have to guess your age at that point. You've just told them how old you are, right? Um, offering that information on um, resumes, um, giving pictures on resumes may, may not always be the best idea. Um, <clears throat> so remember that you, as, as an applicant, um, you're protected against 
discrimination if you're pregnant based on your religion, your age, uh, race, etc. And then the Equal Opportunity um, <laughs> Commission, right? They're charged with um, ins you know, ensuring that, that workers' rights are protected. And so these are some of the things that they look at, right? For instance, the Equal Pay Act, um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which makes it illegal to um, racially discriminate. Um, pregnancy discrimination. Uh, 1978. Um, everyone, I'm sure, has heard of the ADA, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. That was done in 1990, 1991. Um, and when it comes to disability, a person can't be discriminated against that. And it's also um, been expanded to include individuals with alcoholism, former drug use, um, things like that. And again, so the example that I used on the previous slide when I was talking about, um, uh, you know, helping clients get jobs, right? These were, these were some things that were um, uh, uh, discussed, right? And then bona fide occupational qualification, right? BFOQs. Um, and that, that's basically a requirement that certain occupations for which denying an individual employment would otherwise violate the law, such as requirements concerning religion or sex. And actually most BFOQs um, are involved around sex, or I should say gender, right? Um, biological sex or gender. So. Now, I've mentioned job satisfaction several times throughout the presentation. Um, and so there's two aspects to uh, job satisfaction. It's basically our, our cognition and our affect. So in other words, how do I feel about the work that I'm doing, right? And then how is it, that, what do I think about the work that I'm doing? Um, and our cognition and our affect can be affected by the work itself, the job. Um, it can be affected by our own personality, right? And how we're integrated into that and um, our culture. And I will tell you, the company I work for um, right now, they love <laughs> to send out questionnaires. Like every year I'm filling out something about job satisfaction. And um, some companies do that a lot. Some some, some places I worked at didn't do it at all. And the thing with job satisfaction, it can also be measured you know, at a global level. Um, and so when you think of global level, um, that's the overall satisfaction with the work, right? So like I might be overall very happy with my job, um, but then there's also specific factors that may impact my job satisfaction that I may not like as much, right? That might differ from that. So, such as, you know, um, ODS, drug medical billing, for example. So tedious and stuff like that. So that's not the fun part of my job. But overall, I would say I'm very satisfied with my work. So it's two measures that are used uh, for this. So remember it's global level and then specific uh, specific factors. And then let's see. Um, so a question comes in, it says, what about employers that won't hire individuals that are overqualified? Is that fair? So when it comes to overqualified, I don't believe that there is a, and this is just me speaking lay in lay terms. I'm not sure that there's a law that actually, um, uh, says you can't hire someone because they're overqualified for the job. I will tell you that as an employer, um, I'll give you an example. If somebody came and applied for the recovery advocate position at my, uh, at my outpatient treatment center, and by the way, recovery advocate is entry level 
Um, you don't have to be a certified counselor. You can be registered. You can even be in school and not completed because the clinical work that you're doing um, isn't as, uh, um, it's usually handled by others or you're with someone else doing the clinical work, right? Groups or individuals or you're, or, or you're just doing recovery coach stuff. And I get somebody that comes in and they have a master's degree in clinical counseling. You know, my question might be, why are you applying for recovery advocate? First of all, you're not gonna make the money that you need to make to pay back your student loans. First, right? the, the, the pay is not commensurate with your KSAs at this point, right? So a person, so there are legitimate reasons for an overqualified person to maybe not be hired. And here's the other reason. Earlier I was talking about, um, uh, and this is things that companies think about, turnover, the cost of hiring, training, only to have someone leave. If somebody is way overqualified for a job, I'm looking at, well, how long are you staying? Are you gonna be here six months from now, right? Is this to tide you over because you can't get a job in the area that you want for whatever reason? Um, so I could see how an employer might do that. Is it fair? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, it all depends on perspective. So I will tell you another thing that, that, uh, um, that affects job satisfaction is if you're shorthanded or if you're constantly putting out fires because you can't maintain employees. Um, so hiring the right person for the right job for the right reasons um, is, is, and then of course, mentoring, training, and giving them proper orientation and not throwing them to the fire is gonna make job satisfaction a lot greater in my anecdotal experience. Now I'm sure there's some more research that also shows that as well. We did talk about some of that research already. Uh, so that was a good question, good question. Um, when you think about discrimination and what's illegal and not fair, think of it as generally as some kind of physical characteristic about the individual for which they are being discriminated against, right? Being pregnant, um, <clears throat> uh, color of their skin, their religion, ethnicity, um, sexual orientation, uh, gender identification in California, gender expression. Um, those are all protected um, uh, aspects. Other things that lead um, to job satisfaction. Um, and I'm just going to kind of run through these quick. Um, one is autonomy. I will just speak for myself. I love my autonomy. Uh, autonomy. Um, I have a job to do. I know what I'm doing. Um, I, I pretty much like to come in I, and make my appointments, et cetera. Um, and my program manager um, kind of lets me do my thing. I, I love that. And a lot of people do. Um, another aspect of it is work content, you know, variety, um, challenge. Uh, and then here's something that's very important, role clarity. Now, research has found that if a role, if, if an employee if their role is um, ambiguous, if they're not sure what they're doing, that they're probably gonna end up with less job satisfaction because they're never sure what they're supposed to be doing. They might get pulled in different directions, um, might add some uh, added stresses. So the more clarity there is with the role, um, generally the, the happier the individual is. Um, communication is also important. Uh, feedback. Um, and th this is also interesting. Financial rewards has been shown to be a weak correlation with job satisfaction. And if you remember from chapter two, correlation means that there, that there is some, some linkage, right? Um, but salary and job satisfaction has been found to be weak that it's some of these other things that are more important, such as autonomy, work content, development growth, uh, 
their coworkers, things like that. So um, what's interesting too is there was a study that showed that, um, <coughs> oh, I forget what the cutoff was. I think it's 70, $75,000 or $72,000 that people who made over that amount were not that much more happier, were not any more happier than those who made less than that amount. So that the idea that money buys happiness is not really shown in, in, the, in the research. Um, career advancement opportunities is also important for job satisfaction. Uh, a person's professional relations um, with their coworkers, uh, whether a person feels that their supervision is supportive, that they're recognized um, or that they're being treated with fairness. And then of course the workload, we've talked about time pressure uh, a slide or two back. And then of course, work demands. And then also insecurity, job insecurity um, is also linked with job satisfaction. So the more secure a person is, probably the more satisfied they're gonna be. If you're not sure if I'm gonna have a job next week, right? Um, company going through a merger, for example, um, that can add some stress, which we are moving into. So talking about stressors, right, in occupation, and what's the danger? And the danger is that it leads to poor health, um, leads to poor um, job performance, um, and it affects the family life. So stressors include um, having multiple roles. So if I'm doing more than one, one job or more than one person's job, for example, like I was just talking about uh, a minute ago, some stressors with, um, with employee turnover. If there's a lot of turnover. The employees that are remaining there are, are, are pulling more weight, right? Also workplace role ambiguity. We talked about that on the previous slide as well. And here it is showing up again. Um, feeling as though you're stuck in a dead end position, right? So in other words, there's, there's either lack of career progress or there doesn't seem to be um, uh, opportunities for progress and growth. Um, lack of job security, talked about that. Lack of control over work outcomes. Um, interesting and left to feeling isolated. Um, so we're social creatures. We kind of we kind of like to be around others. Uh, and then of course there's work overload. And then we've already talked about uh, discrimination, harassment, and bullying in the previous chapter under social psychology. But here it is showing up again in the workplace. This is where you can see it again. So um, and discrimination doesn't necessarily have to come from the company itself or from a supervisor. It can come from coworkers. It can come from customers that come in the door. Um, same thing with harassment or bullying. Uh, it can come from di several different angles. So I hinted at this a minute ago too with threats to job security with merging companies. And so here you have, so you know, here in the diagram, right? You have the merged company there's company A, company B, and guess what? Both of those companies, they have a sales department. They both have an accounting department. You're not gonna need all that in the new merged company. So those employees are saying to themselves, hey, am I gonna be cut? What's gonna happen? You know, that, that, um, <coughs> that can create a lot of job stress. Um, downsizing. Uh, which sometimes organizations do to try to achieve overall efficiency. Um, and then of course the corporate mergers or the acquisitions, right? One organization purchases another. And then research tries to focus on understanding employee reactions and recommendations for managing um, these organizational ch changes. Let me do some research on that. And by the way, um, I and O, psychology, you can, uh, if you go to SDSU, 
just like a lot of the different chapters that we have, um, uh, they have a really good INO um, professor over there. He's written a couple of books and uh, I took his classes. It was very, very interesting. So believe me, what we're going over tonight, I am skimming the surface. You're not gonna walk out of here tonight being INO experts. Um, but if you wanna know more, SDSU, they have a great, great semester course on it. Then there's also management in an uh, organizational structure. And Douglas McGregor, he, he kind of combined scientific management and human relations into the notion of leadership behavior. And so he looked at two different theories, right? Um, identified uh, two different styles of managers. And he, so he comes up with theory X and theory Y. And theory X, the manager actually assumes, which if you look at this, if you think about it, is actually quite negative, right? The manager assumes that work, workers are inherently lazy, that they're unproductive, um, and that in order to have productivity, that the managers have to have control and they have to use punishments, some sort to, uh, to maintain productivity. And then theory why that manager assumes that people who seek, uh, are people who seek to work hard, right? Um, they want to increase their productivity um, and that they can work together. Managers and workers can work together um, to solve problems and that they do not need to be controlled or punished. So the next slide kind of breaks down this a little bit further. Um, so theory X. So this manager looks at people and they go, you know what? People dislike work, they avoid it. People avoid responsibility. Uh, people want to be told what to do uh, and that goals are achieved through rules and punishments. Strict, um, tend to be strict, task oriented, right? Uh, individuals. Whereas theory why managers, they're under the assumption that people enjoy work and find it natural, right? Gives people purpose. Um, people are more satisfied when they're given responsibility. Uh, people want to take part in, in uh, setting their own work goals and that goals are actually achieved through enticements and rewards. So those are the two different management styles. And then David Cliff, I'm sorry, Donald Clifton, he <coughs> came up with um, what's known as the strengths-based based management approach. And what um, that does is that focuses on the employee's strengths. And he argued that strengths provide the greatest opportunity for growth. Uh, for growth. One of the downsides to this um, is that focusing on the strengths, that's great. That is really, really good. But then what may get neglected is uh, the weaknesses. So that doesn't get worked on as much. So really kind of, you know, strength-based is very important. Actually, we use strength-based in counseling. Right, um, a strengths-based approach is is more client-centered, but it's also important to to help develop the weaknesses as well, so that there can be improvements there. And then there's the transactional leader leadership, um, and that's where that leader focuses on supervision and organizational goals, and that it's received through um, a system of rewards and punishments. And uh, it's really basically designed to maintain the organizational status quo, right? So everything is um, kind of maintained just through transactional leadership. And then transformational leadership um, has four characteristics to it, right? There are charismatic role models. Um, there's, uh, they tend to be inspirational optimistic about goal attainment. Yes, you can do it. Um, intellectually stimulating and encourage critical thinking and uh, problem solving. So there's critical thinking coming up again. Um, and then 
um, individually consider it, right? And um, seeking to change um, the organization. So charisma, inspiration, intellectually stimulating and individually considerate are those four aspects. Oops, not too far. And then when it comes to goals, teamwork and, and work teams, there's a couple of different approaches. So with the team-based approach, um, many companies struggle, uh, structure their organization so that work can be delegated to work teams, which can be advantageous, right? So a work team is an, a group of individuals within the organization and they're, they're given a specific task. So this is what this team is working on. And what's, the, what's good about that is that it does bring together diverse skills, experience, and expertise. Um, what research has shown though, is that while there can be greater productivity, doesn't always deliver it. Um, so then here's, here's a question. So why do some teams work well while other teams do not? And so there's that social loafing again that comes up. And if you remember when we talked about social loafing before, that's the idea where not everybody on the team is pulling their own weight. Another thing that, that um, might impact a team's productivity is their communication styles. Um, if it's poor communication, then there's, um, uh, there's gonna be issues there, right? So not everybody is on the same page. And then poor decision-making skills due to conformity effects. So earlier, when we were looking, when we were looking at the ash effect in the um, previous chapter in social psychology, here is where it might show up again, right? So somebody might have a really good idea, but never really presents it to the team because, because of the ash effect, as an example. And then uh, also conflict within the group. That is definitely going to be um, adversely affect productivity. And then finally, the team halo effect. And that's where teams are given credit for their successes. Individuals, uh, individuals within a team are ready to form the team's goals. I can hear you. Uh, that's the team halo effect. <clears throat> We can't hear you. We can hear you, Professor. Hold on one second. Uh, let me see what my problem is. It says my auto is messed up. Thank you. And I just got a notice here too, and I'm not sure why. Give me one second. I'm gonna pause the recording while I try to fix this. My apologies. Okay, I think I fixed my audio. <laughs> um, and so it, it sounds like from the feedback that I'm getting from the class that it was the last part of this slide that the, that the audio uh, messed up. And I, what I was talking about was the team halo effect. And the halo effect is when a team is given the credit for their successes, but individuals within the team get blamed for team failures. And the point I was trying to make there was is that that obviously is gonna have an impact on, um, on, on morale, productivity. Um, you know, when it comes to a team, if you're a team, um, the team's success is, is everyone's success, right? Uh, the team's failure is everyone's failure, uh, but teams don't always work well because of the items that we talked about previously, the social loafing, the poor communication, um, the ash effect, as an example, um, and then inter, interpersonal conflict within the group or uh, intra-group um, conflicts, right? Two people not getting along, and that can act adversely affect um, that. You know, it's interesting with the halo effect is, um, so here we're talking about the team halo effect. There's also a halo effect that we'll talk about again in, um, in the therapy section where counselors actually look at their clients with a halo effect and can 
uh, which can adversely impact their, um, their progress as well, because they may not be um, working on the right, or, or, or the, I shouldn't say the right things, but, but the most effective aspects of that person's life. Getting back to the same thing with the team halo effect, um, the focus could just be in all the wrong spots, right? So halo effect is not, is, is, is actually not a good thing. All right, did I skip one too far? Uh, no, there we go. Sorry, lost track of where I was. Okay, so at the beginning, we talked about organizational culture as far as like when orienting new um, employees, right? During orientation, you want to talk about the organizational culture. And, you know, so what are the organizational cultures? That's, that's, that's a organization's values, their vision, um, their norms, their interactions among its employees. Oh, and by the way, also their, their activities in the community um, can be part of that as well. Um, <clears throat> some, some cultures, some organizations um, take pride in their community involvement as well as their um, own internal involvement. So, but the organizational culture is how does it run? How does it operate? And how does it make its decisions? And research in 2003 found that there were three laser, layers, sorry, in organizational culture. Um, one was observable artifacts. So that's, you know, jargon, slang, um, the humor that's used, um, stories that might get told, you know, around the water cooler, for example. Um, and what practices do they have? You know, what rituals? do they do? Um, then there's what's known as espoused values. And these are concepts or beliefs that the management or the entire organization and, and the ma uh, management team, employee team actually endorses. So they, they say, yes, we're for social justice or yes, we're for um, integrity and ethics, whatever, whatever it is that's in their um, system. And then there's also those things that are basic assumptions. Um, and these are usually things that are not questioned um, and are usually unobservable. You know, I kind of just used ethics as an example um, and integrity. At one company, that might be a basic uh, assumption, right? Oh, everybody comes in and we all act ethically, um, <clears throat> but you're not seeing you know, maybe some evidence of that. Espoused values might be those things, and you are going to see these things. Um, you are going to hear about these things, um, such as community involvement. They might even have posters or signs about it, right? There's ways that they are, um, are actually uh, communicating um, these values. And then there's diversity training. Um, which is designed to educate employees about cultural differences. And the idea here is that we want to improve teamwork and understanding um, and to reduce uh, prejudice. If you reduce prejudice, you're ultimately going to reduce actual discrimination, right? So that would be um, the goal of um, diversity training, which could be an espoused value as an example. So if you come into a company and their, their vision statement actually talks about diversity in the workplace, and then they actually provide diversity training, you would say, oh, this is an example of espoused values. It's something I could feel, hear, touch, see, right? Professor, when you mentioned about diversity training, yes. can that also work in those companies that are like a, um, around the world and they are different cultures involved depending on the country that they are i mean counting the values of the company but also depending where they are located on the culture of the employees too um i, I, I don't confuse you <laughs> yeah no 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 let me, let me see can you rephrase your question i want to make sure that i that i so in one companies all around the world but they okay. got their own values 
how can they uh, use that diverse ring culture, but actually defending their own company value? Oh, I, I, I see what you're saying. So in other words, a global company, right? Um, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I have not like seen any research on that or, or actually explored that. Um, I could probably answer the question to the best of my own personal anecdotal um, experience or, or, you know, or things that I've heard, um, but I don't know that that would necessarily be helpful. I would imagine that um, a global company, their diversity training may be different depending on where they are in the world. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it makes sense because sometimes maybe it's not way seen in other countries, but it's more usual to do in this country. Right, right. So like for instance, um, you know, in the United States, there's a wide range of diversity here, right? Um, you go to, um, oh, I'm trying to think of a place. Work on Sundays. I mean, over time in other countries, no, oh, because right. it's religious, a religious thing. Sure. And it's yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. And, and yes. And, and that's another example of that where laws are going to be different. Um, and you're right. Um, uh, you know, Southeast Asia. You, you know, um, uh, their religious practices are going to be very different than what you find in Kansas, right? Um, you're going to have a, a lot of Buddhists in Southeast Asia, for example. By the way, there's also a lot of Muslims there too, um, and a lot of Christians, uh, but, but, you're, but mainly a lot of, um, of uh, Buddhists. Like when I went to Indonesia, um, and I went to uh, Cambodia, right? So it is going to be regionally different depending on where they are in the world. And you're right, laws are going to be different. So when I think of diversity training mostly, and of course, um, that's what makes your question a good question. Um, and this might be my own um, ethnocentric bias showing up. I usually think of the United States. Does that make sense? So, yeah. um, so <laughs> Thank you for asking the question. It kind of points out my own, my own, it's like, why haven't I looked at that before, right? So, let's, all right. So let's talk about sexual harassment. Now, uh, sexual harassment has become, you know, huge in recent years um, with the Me Too movement and, uh, you know, some high profile cases. You know, but there's a lot of sexual harassment that that um, happens in the workplace, um, and basically, it's. I think everyone knows what it is: sexually based behavior that's knowingly unwanted or has an adverse effect on a person's employment status, interferes with their job performance, um, creates a hostile or or some type of intimidating um, work environment, and you know. A lot of times, well, there's a couple of different kinds, right? So there's quid pro quo, which is Latin for, um, you know, you give me something to get something. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So when you hear quid pro quo, that's usually someone um, directly saying, uh, sleep with me and you'll get this promotion. That would be an example of quid pro quo. Um, even though that's a, a phrase that gets thrown around a lot, um, there are, well, there are examples of quid pro quo, but most of the time, the sexual harassment is not that overt, um, but it comes in the form of jokes, um, unwanted touching, um, things like that. Um, and so I, every company that I have worked for has had some kind of sexual harassment training. I'm sure some of you students have been uh, through sexual harassment training. And if you have it, you will. Um, it's just the nature of, of um, being employed now. Um, and hostile work environment, um, sexual harassment, that's where the employee experiences 
um, conditions where it's hostile, it's intimidating. Um, for, in, for example, uh, telling dirty jokes in the break room, right? Or to someone. Um, now the two people involved, it may not be a problem with, but anyone overhearing that, that it might be offensive. Um, so you kind of have to think about how your, well, I say your behavior, not that anybody here is doing sexual harassment, but how a person's behavior can impact not only the person directly involved in, in that joke, for instance, but who else around it is hearing it, right? Um, so, <coughs> uh, let's see, what else did I wanna say? I think that's, that's it. Any questions on quid pro quo or hostile environment? Um, hostile work environment. And another place that we have to kind of talk about is, you know, violence in the workplace. So, you know, the, there used to be this, um, you know, in the early 80s, right, there was um, when workplace violence really started getting a lot of uh, uh, attention, was around like postal workers and things like that. And so there was kind of a pejorative that was, um, you know, uh, phrase coined, right? Going postal. Um, and, and that came from like that kind of workplace violence. Um, you know, going in and shooting up the place or whatever. Um, so Workplace violence is defined as violence that's a threat of violence against workers. Um, it can occur within the workplace. It can, can, it can occur outside the workplace. Um, it includes uh, physical violence, harassment, intimidation. Um, any disruptive behavior um, can range from like threats uh, to verbal abuse to actual physical assaults, hitting someone, punching someone, um, to actually you know, uh, committing murder. Some warning signs that people might wanna be looking for would be intimidating behavior, threats, sabotaging equipment, um, or a, a, a coworker whose behavior has just radically changed. And I'm getting a warning that my internet is unstable. So if anybody needs a repeat, just let me know. Hit me up in the chat. Um, some of the things that bring about violence in the workplace is when the individual who's perpetrating this uh, feels that they've been treated unfairly or unjustly, or they've been disrespected in some way. Um, and the idea behind this is to try to uh, mitigate this would be procedural justice, right? So in other words, establishing fairness of processes by which outcomes um, are determined in conflicts among, um, with or among employees and management, right? So having, having a way for employees to actually um, feel as though they're being treated fairly, if there's disagreement. Other research shows that um, history of aggression and the amount of alcohol consumed are actually accurate predictors of violence against a coworker. So they, they did the research and, um, and found these two things could predict that. Um, feelings of being treated unfairly or, or not being trusted uh, were also predictors of aggression against a supervisor. And then other predictors of aggression against a subordinate was like job security, and alcohol consumption. So you can see alcohol being involved here um, uh, as, as part of it. So statistic here, 2 million workers are physically assaulted or threatened with assault every year. That's a lot of people. So workplace violence is, a, is another important area of study in IO psychology. And then human factor psychology, we actually talked a little bit about this um, earlier when we were talking about um, uh, ergonomics. And remember that, that that term originated in Europe, although we use it all the time here. Excuse me, just one second. Okay. 
Okay, sorry about that. Um, <coughs> my, uh, my lungs are giving me a little trouble today. Sorry about that. Um, fortunately, we're almost finished. So we'll be done here in just a few minutes. Um, so if you remember that picture from the beginning with the ergonomics, the workstation, the position of the employee, um, that kind of stuff, that's, that's what human factor psychology kind of focuses on there. And they also look at um, attention, um, cognitive engineering, task analysis, and then cognitive task analysis. And so when it comes to um, attention, you know, they're asking questions like, how is attention maintained? What about the tasks uh, maintains attention, right? How to design systems that support attention, right? So, um, cognitive engineering also includes, uh, you know, human and software interactions. Um, especially in decision-making processes, and that how, do, how is it that workers use and obtain information that's provided by software? And then breaking down the elements of the task is important for the task analysis. If, if you recall from um, uh, earlier, the, uh, oh, her name just went out of my head, but she's on a previous slide. That's what she was focused on. Um, how many steps can be eliminated to make this, this task more efficient, more safely? Um, how can productivity be increased by doing this? And then- Lilia, the, the lady? Yes, yeah, I just can't think of her name at the moment. Went out of my head. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then cognitive task analysis is breaking down the elements of the cognitive task. So how decision-making occurs. And that's what they're looking at when they're studying those items. And that is it. That is the last slide. So um, that concludes chapter 13, INO psychology. And um, you all have a good evening. <laughs>